You're listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. You can hear the show live Monday through Friday from 9 to 11 on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN and streaming at accesswdun.com. You can find all things Martha Zoller at marthazoller.com. Chuck Bullock is here with me right now. Dr. Bullock is the Richard B. Russell Professor of Political Science at the University of Georgia and is the author and editor of numerous books on American political culture, the South, and electoral policies. Um, Dr. Bullock, I know, are you working on a book right now, or are you always working on a book? I am working on a new book. Yeah, it's uh, just the very beginning stages, but it's going to look at how Georgia changed in the 1960s. Wow, that's great. So how many books have you written? Have you lost track? Uh, well, the one that's under review right now, I think would be number 40. Wow, that is amazing. That is amazing. So how do you do it? I mean, you obviously have been very blessed because you're you're about the president's age, right? And you are yeah. <laughs> extremely st- still very busy, very involved. How have you done it? Is it just good luck? Well, it's probably good genes. Uh, my, my dad died a couple of months before ninety nine, before his hundredth birthday, rather, and so I think that's more than anything else. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right. So, what do you think about all this talk about the president's age? I mean, you're about his age, like I said, but you're one of the most well thought of of political analysts in the country. What do you think about it? Yeah, how age you got yourself about people at different times, you know, uh, and because he's had a lot of pressure during his career. He's been in the public spotlight since he was 30 years old. He gets elected to the Senate just before he turns 30, and I'm, that's bound to take a lot out of you. you know, I know you do a lot of traveling, too, Martha, but uh, if you're a United States senator with the kind of leadership positions he had, you know, you're always on the go. There's probably very little downtime for which the body to recover, so that's probably part of what is catching up with him. Don't you think, too, if you go back to, and I try to be as fair as I can to the president, in that when he ran for president, I think the first time, he had to get out because he was kind of plagiarizing and making up stories, and he still kind of likes to make up stories. I think that's part of the way he communicates, not to make it okay, but the way he communicates is he tries to find a story that relates to every group, which is a good tactic to use, but sometimes he goes a little too far when he's telling the story. Well, yeah, that, uh, Ben, you're talking on this, I think, goes back to 1988, in which he had plagiarized a speech made by the head of the British Labor Party. Uh, <laughs> of course, now if you try to do something like that, it would be caught almost immediately because of the availability to go and check anything that gets said now on the Internet. Um but, yeah, it, it is often a tactic by politicians to try to relate to the group that they're before. And if they can find some kind of hook, that is part of what they do. And, and we see that also when, when people run for office. You know, they will have on even the tiniest little card they're passing out, things indicating where they went to school, what church they belong to, uh, those kinds of things. That's in part because of a voter who doesn't know anything else about them. I say, well, I share this with that person, and therefore I'll go ahead and vote for them. So, Same reason the politicians like to have pictures taken with them and their family and their dog. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So we've, of course, had a lot happen in Georgia. In the, I mean, Georgia's been a busy political landscape for 20 years, really, but especially yep. in the last five years. We've had a very close governor's election in 2018. Um probably as close, maybe not the closest ever, but one of the closest ever. Um, We had, of course, the 2020 election. A lot of people counted Brad Raffensperger and Brian Kemp out. They ended up doing even better than they did in their first election, mainly because of the results and being able to get independents and, uh, you know, uh, open-minded Democrats to vote for them. Where are we today in Georgia, and what are your thoughts about how Governor Kemp is doing in this second term? Yeah, we are still a red state, but put a big asterisk to that. Democrats can win under one condition, and that is if they can run against Donald Trump or someone who is very closely associated with Donald Trump. Because what that does, it moves a critical element of the electorate from R to D. 
that critical element would be college-educated white voters. Now, even Donald Trump got the bulk of those voters, but if a Democrat can get about 40% of that white college-educated electorate, that's going to be enough for the Democrat to win. So we see the Brian Kemp, Brad Raffensperger, they did very well. Indeed, they did much better in 2020 than they did in 2016, and they were at the top of the Donald Trump hit list. So in Georgia, being a Republican and being somewhat separated from Donald Trump, that works very well for you. It worked well for those Republicans within the Republican primary who were challenged by Trump-backed candidates. I mean, virtually all of those individuals went ahead, and Trump was opposing them, but they got renominated. So it works both for a Republican within the re- Republican primary and in the general election. I mean, I think Burt Jones probably was the most successful Trump-backed candidate probably in the country as far as how he did in his primary and in the general. Um, I don't know if that's because of Trump or not, or if the fact he probably benefited from being on the, not on the ticket with Kemp, but being being a Republican, people aren't going to vote, I think, for a Democratic lieutenant governor if they're voting for a Republican governor. Um, so he did all right there. But I think it's kind of interesting to see how the lieutenant governors tried to navigate this because he, clearly he wants to run for governor. I mean, there are still signs in certain parts of Georgia that say Burt Jones governor from when he was going to run for governor uh-huh. before he decided uh-huh. not to. So it's interesting to see how he's positioning himself. Yeah, well, let, me, let me put a little bit slightly different spin on, on Jones. Yes, he did win, but he won with the smallest margin of any Republican who succeeded. So I would say that his affiliation with Trump actually hurt him a bit there. In terms of what his long-term plans are, yeah, it looks very like, like he's going to run for governor in 2026 since Brian Kemp is term limited. Uh, and I think... It seemed to me that there was some tension within the last legislative session between the governor and lieutenant governor. And uh, if Jones continues along the line of preparing to run for governor in 2026, we're probably going to see more instances in which uh, Kemp and Jones take somewhat different positions. You know, Governor Kemp, I'm sure you've heard him say this before. He says his one goal is to prove in 2024 that we are a red state. And he has been much more involved in not only state politics, but national politics, going as far as, you know, saying he is he will vote for Trump if he's the nominee. But but also revealing in that same interview that he he's telling Republicans to come up with a deal on this budget so that we don't have to deal with this. He has changed kind of the way he's approached things, hasn't he? Yeah, yes. I think he is maybe on the same page that I am. That is that, uh, you know, if Trump is the nominee, it's going to make it much harder for Republicans to hold on to Georgia, where probably any other Republican, if tapped to be the presidential nominee, probably wins Georgia relatively easily. You know, there's a new poll, um, uh, with the University of, and uh, not with the University of Georgia, that says that that Trump's approval rating is at the highest. It's a CNN ABC poll uh, that says Trump's approval rating is at the highest it's been since he left office at forty eight percent, and that Biden's is at the lowest. Now it's considered to be an outlier poll because all the rest of them have mm-hmm. it a lot closer, but it's it's interesting to see all this bouncing around, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is right, and that's why what. Analysts do is they look at multiple polls and <laughs> look for the average because you get some outliers of the upside, some on the downside. So yeah, that's why Real Clear Politics gives you that average across all polls, which have been done recently. Chuck Bullock is here with me today. He is a professor at the University of Georgia. He encouraged me to go back to school a number of years ago, and I'm so glad that I did. And uh, you know, Chuck, we got a question in from somebody I'd been talking about, Senator Ossoff, and his sort of back and forth about the police training center. And I I had said uh, before you came on that I think it's one of the few missteps that he's had in how he's dealt with his his very thin margin of of winning. He he really does act like a guy who understands he's in a 50-50 state. And, um, you know, the question was, he talks like a moderate but vote straight Democratic caucus. And he'll lead you to believe that he's keeping the really radical stuff from coming up for a vote. Um, and I do like Senator Ossoff quite a bit. But, 
you know, he's going to run for re-election probably. I mean, we don't know. Maybe he'll be a cabinet member if, if Biden gets re-elected. And then there's a lot of talk about uh, Governor Kemp running for that Senate seat. And then, of course, that means that you'll have a whole plethora of people because he's term limited running for governor. Your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, it's going to be really exciting in 2026 because the names we're hearing on the Republican side who might run for governor include at least three of our statewide constitutional offices. So if those become vacant, then you can expect to have wild competition for each of those on probably both the Democratic and the Republican side. And it looks like, yes, the Georgia will continue to be very competitive in 2026. And if uh, Governor Kemp were to choose to take on uh, John Ossoff, that would you know, probably be the strongest Republican who could come forward. Kemp can raise lots of money. He has, of course, universal name recognition and uh, is very, very popular. So uh, it's going to be an exciting time for us to be in Georgia in 2026. And as you said, it's been pretty exciting for those of us who love politics for the last generation now. Well, and Senator Ossoff, I think, has made an effort to, like, he's come to this radio station a number of times. He's gone to other radio stations in heavily conservative areas. Um, You know, he initially didn't want to do this show because I formerly worked for his opponent, Senator Perdue, and I was talking to Jake Best, his communications guy, and he says, well, he really doesn't want to do your show because you worked for Senator Perdue. And I said, Jake, for the first time in a generation, there are Democrats running up and down the ballot in in races all around North Georgia. For a long time in North Georgia, there were no Democrats running. Uh-huh. And and I said, if he comes on shows like mine, he, he not only helps himself, he helps other people. And Jake goes, wow, you're really good at this. <laughs> I said, well, you know. <laughs> you are. You're I, very good. Yeah. Thank you. I want to get the best <laughs> interviews. I mean, if, if he's going to be representing us, I want him to come on the program. But I do think that he made a misstep in this sort of support non-support on the police training center i don't know if it's going to have legs or not and conversely i think that senator warnock was made a mistake in speaking out against it because it's really not his business you know what i mean it's really not it's it has to do with the atlanta city council and he hurts those atlanta city council members right yeah this is the kind of thing where probably a federal official would be much better advised to simply not have a position on it to listen (laughs) and Nod uh, and whoever you're talking to, and don't take a position because you know this is not a federal operation. You know, federal money I don't think is going into this, and so the feds have no influence over it. It's strictly a local issue, and it's one which seems to me has undergone a real transformation. That initially there didn't seem to be that much pushback against the idea, and that's why it had overwhelming support within the Atlanta City Council, and then. Uh, it gradually builds, and now uh, it's become very controversial. So it may be you know, heartburn for those, it was 11 members of the council who voted for it at some point in the future. And so Ross off, uh, you know, whatever happens on this, it's going to be three years removed from his election probably. And so right. that's the kind of thing I don't think is necessarily going to still be at the front of people's minds Come fall of 2026. Well, and it doesn't make sense to me because the 2020 riots that were all across this country were all about police training. At least that's what I thought they were about. They were overuse of force. And the cry was, we need better training. And this particular facility, it used to be a police training center. It just went into disrepair. So it's, you know, I do, I agree with you that the pushback is louder right now. But I would disagree that the average Atlantan would prefer to have it. I think the Atlanta, the average Atlantan wants this kind of training for their police officers, firefighters, EMTs, all of that, because there's a lot of concern about safety in neighborhoods everywhere. I mean, I even had, you know, I live up in Gainesville, kind of in a rural part north of, this, north of Gainesville itself, and, you know, we're even having some, some break-ins and that kind of thing in our neighborhoods, and, you know, you got to be a little more careful right now. There's just a lot going on. So I just think that it's better you're right not to take a position. So listen, one final um, discussion is about this impending, again, impending fiscal cliff we're going to possibly go over. Um, 
I think they'll probably come up with some kind of last minute deal. If I were making the deal, if I were queen of the world, I would say do something that will last till the next election and then in this next year actually pass a budget on time. But I know they're not going to do what I say because the voters had a chance to vote on me and voted against me. So it was okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we just lurch from crisis to crisis when it comes to funding the government. And we know it has to be done. Uh, and the fact that uh, Kevin McCarthy has such a narrow margin makes it virtually impossible now because we've moved beyond. It used to be, you know, talk about in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, on into the 80s, even if your own party was split, you could probably piece together a bipartisan coalition. You know, bring the adults into the room. Right, <laughs> right. And work something out. But now... Uh, if a Democrat opposes it, all Republicans are going to vote against it. And if a Republican opposes it, all Democrats are going to vote against it. So you you have to govern solely within your own party. Uh, and this is a tremendous test of the leadership skills of a person. And it may be that some folks simply cannot be led. Uh, we, we do have people elected from small constituencies. They may feel that they are adequately and accurately representing the view of those constituents and they're therefore willing to turn their backs on the pleas made by their own party leadership. Well, you know, in the primary system, I understand where the primary system came from. It was because there was this idea that people in smoke-filled rooms were deciding who the candidates were going to be. But what's happened with primaries, and this, of course, this is some of my research bore this out, was that mm -hmm. it, it has, especially in the case of women, is that you you tend to be more liberal if you run in a Democrat primary and win, more conservative if you run in a Republican primary, and that you know, the, women are perceived to be more liberal than their male counterparts, right. so it helps Democrats and hurts Republicans. Now, we have right. made a lot of progress, Republicans have, in getting more women into the into the mix, but I'm not sure if the smoke-filled rooms didn't give us better candidates, and I can't believe I'm saying that out loud. <laughs> well, there, there is something to that, yeah, uh, especially, say, at the presidential level, choosing a president. Because the people in the smoke-filled room, they're kind of building their whole careers with their party. And so they're more likely to go with a person who they perceive as going to be good for the party, both in the short run and the long run, and not be moved by, you know, immediate passions. So do, in the, on the Democratic side with the superdelegates, is that sort of the extension of the smoke-filled room? <laughs> well, yeah, although that's kind of fallen by the wayside now. Has it? Yeah. Yeah, right. It does, you know, because of, of again several years ago, and there was the thought, well, gee, they have too much influence. Right. But yeah, uh, I agree with you. you know, we 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 used to have only a few primaries to choose presidential preferences. You got a reading where the public was, but you had a lot of play in the system when the national convention came together. Now there's no play in the system. That everyone is pledged to some particular candidate and is locked into that. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed that the um, usually when you have an incumbent president, you have an early primary, I mean, an early convention because you want a long general election, sec you know, cycle. And this time, the Democrats are having it in the last possible week they can have it and still get a name on the ballot. Do you think that matters or means anything? Uh Probably not. I mean, it looks like things are pretty much locked down. I mean, my position has been for several months now that if either party were to come up with a new face, they'd probably have the election locked up uh, for, yeah. for 2024. But uh, because they're split within both parties. I mean, Democrats are looking at a situation where most Democratic voters do not want Joe Biden to run again, but the party leadership says, yeah, he's the one we're going with him. On the Republican side, uh, the rank and file, very much committed to Donald Trump, but we see some leaders, and uh, Brian Kemp and even more so Jeff Duncan and some other Georgians, are openly raising questions about that, and from all reports from the media, lots of other elected Republicans are saying, you know, we would be much happier if we had someone else with whom we could run. So there's divisions within both parties, but it doesn't look like the system is going to be responsive on either side. So ironically, next year, we're just going to have from a statewide 
basis, we're going to have a presidential candidate and a public service commission, maybe, right. because it's in the courts right now. You know, <laughs> it, it might change everything up again. Uh, but, of course, all the congressmen are going to have to run, you know, with whoever it happens to be. So it's going to be interesting to watch. And Lord knows all eyes are going to be on Georgia. Dr. Bullock, if people want to read your work or follow your work, how can they do that? Well, I've got <laughs> probably the only one they really biggest get excited about reading might be my book on the three governors controversy, which is historical. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, I, I put out a, a few things that kind of circulate around to friends, which kind of deal with contemporary topics. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I, well, I guess I you love, really want to buy one of my books, go to Amazon. <laughs> that's right. I love reading your work, Dr. Bullock. Thank you so much for being with me today. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Grover Norquist is here with me today from Americans for Tax Reform. And he is called by the New Republic the right-wing zealot who wrecked the budget process and made Washington dysfunctional. I heard you on the Ruthless podcast a couple of weeks ago, and I had to have you back on the program. We've been together a number of times. And what I loved about that discussion is how you just laid out how Americans for Tax Reform and you specifically, um, you know, made it to where no politician is ever going to campaign on raising taxes again. Well, what we put together was in support of the 1986 tax reform bill that Reagan did, which was a pledge never to raise uh, taxes. So once we reduced the rates, as Reagan did uh, in 86, bipartisan basis, by the way, many Democrats voted for that bill. The Democratic Party is a very different party than it was in 1986. And uh, we started to get mostly Republicans to sign the pledge. Uh, In 1994, uh, two Democrats in the Senate and five in the House who were Democrats switched and became uh, Republicans after the 94 election. All of them had signed the pledge. So the only Democrats who were willing to promise not to raise taxes left the Democratic Party, became Republicans. uh, And since 1994, we've had the vast majority of Republicans in the House and the Senate sign a pledge. I will vote against, I will oppose and vote against any tax increase. Every Republican uh, running for president, everyone who was the nominee signed the pledge and kept it. Uh, this is, of course, after Bush, 41, got elected because he promised not to raise taxes, won the primary against Bob Dole because Bush said he would never raise taxes. And then his advisor said, oh, that's OK. No one will notice if you raise taxes. And then after a very successful presidency, he managed the collapse of the Soviet Union. He kicked Iraq out of Kuwait without sticking around for 25 years to see what happened. Um, And he had one problem. He raised taxes. He lost. He was humiliating uh, loss. So Republicans learned, take the pledge, win the elect, win the primary, take the pledge never to raise taxes, win the general, keep the pledge, get reelected. And the modern Republican Party at the national level and in many states, not every state, but in many states, the party is the party that will never raise your taxes. Well, because they we bring, small countries you can't pronounce because we have plenty of revenue. The problem is not revenue. I mean, it's it's become a trite saying, Grover, to say we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. But it's absolutely yes. true. You've got the president going around saying he reduced the deficit by one point seven trillion. Well, that's true. The year coming out of covid with COVID spending, but this year it's going to be $2 trillion again as far as the deficit goes. So we we haven't learned our lesson. As Nikki Haley pointed out, and this is not an endorsement, but as she pointed out uh, in the last debate, you know, there are Republicans and Democrats that have voted for these budgets. So we're up against another, quote, fiscal cliff, okay? And you can say what you want about the personality of John Kasich, but he, when he was budget chairman, they passed balance, They passed budgets, they paid down the debt, and they got them done on time, okay? So it was, it was one of those things. What's going to happen, and what do you advise people that call you and ask you what's going to happen or what they should do related to this budget process that we're facing right now? Uh, the budget process does not fix until you have uh, a Republican Senate and a Republican That's presidency. Right now, yep. we narrowly we narrowly have the House. Any six Republicans can walk off the floor uh, for any reason. Okay, 
Uh, they could be moderates. They could be conservatives. They could be people who wanted more subsidies for agriculture. They could, you know, there's six people who want anything, uh, good and bad. And that makes the present house ungovernable. Uh, it is very difficult to get, uh, you know, to herd cats and get everybody to agree because what you put forward in the house, when it goes to the Senate and when it goes to the president, it's going to get mangled. Okay. It's not as if what you pass out of the house is the final bill. But it is the starting point. And when we did the debt ceiling increase, uh, Leader McCarthy and all parts of the House um, got together and they put a couple of things. They said, you know what? Let's reduce the number of IRS agents. They said, let's abolish the additional ones. Well, when after negotiations, we dropped it by $20 billion. Was that everything we wanted? No, we wanted to drop it by $80 billion. But we got a $20 billion reduction in the number of IRS agents they were getting. There were a whole series of minor wins you got, and that's good, that's important, but you don't get fundamental change until you have unified government, which is why states like Georgia and Florida and South Carolina uh, and Texas, which have unified Republican governors, are able to do some very interesting and important things, and divided government in Michigan and Wisconsin is not able to. Yeah, I mean, we are working our way to lower tax rates here in Georgia, and we've done some slowly. property slow, very slowly, way too slowly, but we're getting there. Um, and we've done some property tax rollbacks and, you know, all of that sort of thing. But I would like to see us, because our neighbors to the north and south of us don't have income tax, I would like to see us get rid of it. I mean, that's what we ought to do. And hopefully in the final two years of a Kemp administration, he'll do that. One of the things Kemp, Kemp has supported reducing uh, the rate, bringing it down to a single rate. Once you get a single rate income tax, it becomes possible to do what North Carolina has been doing. They spent 11 years taking the highest uh, income tax rate uh, in the Southeast um, down dramatically. They just passed a bill that will bring it to 2.49%. Okay. It used to be about 7.7. This will bring it down to 2.49 over time. As revenue comes in, instead of spending it, you reduce the, the tax rate permanently. Uh, that is how North Carolina is, mark, is take going down step by step. It is what Iowa and uh, our friends in Nebraska have voted in. They're en route to go to zero. It is what Kentucky and West Virginia have passed. In the next 10, 12 years, they'll all be at zero as well. Take it down slowly. It doesn't have to happen overnight. You take it step by step as revenue comes in. Arizona's gone from 4.5% down to 2.5%, and then they're going to go from there to zero. North Dakota had seven rates. They brought that down to two. All their rates are under 2% now, and they're going to go on to zero. So there are 12 states right now that are committed, all Republican states, are committed to go to zero personal income tax. Laboratory, you know, laboratories in the states, right, Grover? You got it. And that's that's where Georgia can look around and say, what's worked in the other states? Let's do that. Absolutely. So what do you think is ultimately going to happen? Are they going to come up with a deal for five or six weeks and then have a budget? Or what do you think? I know there's you don't have a crystal ball, but you're as knowledgeable yeah. as anyone is. Well, the Freedom Caucus, which should see themselves as the more conservative guys, are they want to pat they want perfect today, not good yesterday. Um and it, it makes it tough to do because you can't get to perfect with a Democratic Senate. You, you can't even get to awful with a Democratic Senate and a Democratic presidency. You're going to really be taking small steps. So unless they can get together and pass a bill from which you can negotiate, the Senate will say, OK, we're in charge here. They'll get together with the White House. They'll pass a bill. It'll come back to the House and you could end up with them with the Democrats and a handful of Republicans making a decision it, it they may disempower the house if they can't come together and negotiate as a team so if they negotiate as a team it'll be less awful than if they don't negotiate it as a team in which case it'll just be awful and we don't get to good or fair or acceptable uh without a republican house senate and presidency it took them 62 years to build the behemoth government that they did <clears throat> 62 years of Democrat control in Congress from 1932 to 1994. 
That's a lot of time they, they had to build that. We're not going to take it down in a week. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. We talk to Randy Davidson on a regular basis uh, from Georgia Entertainment News. And there is a lot of news right now because people are getting back to work. Randy, how are you? Hey, wow, wow. Yes, we're all excited. I mean, we're not we're not all the way all the way there yet, but um definitely definitely a good time, good momentum as we you know, as we put this necessary activity uh, hopefully closer to being behind us than in front of us, you know, when you have a unionized sort of workforce and everything. So you have those things have to be worked out, and we, we, there was some good news this week. So um, how did this impact, because I know you were in the middle of a big tour around the state to kind of introduce people to all kinds of things related to the entertainment business. How did the strike impact that? I think I think in a strange way, you know, the strike, the strike sort of ha, sort of brought to attention the industry and a better light to the legislators. And that, you know, the, the, the road show that we've been doing, which we just we just had a great event in Augusta last week and we'll be in Columbus next week on Thursday. Um, but the purpose of the road show was to go to these to go to communities around Georgia because the governor and the speaker and and uh uh, the lieutenant governor named a committee to take a look at the film tax credit and say, hey, are, are we getting our bang for the buck for, for, for the credit that, the, that Georgia provides? And so, you know, we entered the roadshow when, when, when the strike was not really going and everything. So they were reviewing that. So we were doing it anyway. The strike just sort of highlighted, you know, hey, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Georgians that work in this industry and that provide services to productions that – that Georgia supports and, and, and recruits. So in a strange way, it, 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 you know, it kind of brought to light that obviously we'd rather there not be a strike because we feel like the industry stands on its own, um, as a great investment for Georgia. But, uh, but definitely, definitely, um, um, certainly made it, made it apparent that there's a lot of, economic activity as a result of of, of Georgia's and uh, uh support of the industry well isn't that really the point of a strike though is to show you what life is like if those workers aren't there and that's you know i mean that it in this case i guess it worked and uh you know and i'm so glad you brought up the committee that was appointed because i'm getting lots of questions from listeners as well as comments from legislators related to the tax credit of course and i know you've heard all this before you know the the hardliners about taxes think that you know we ought to get rid of all the tax credits and then give as much money back to the to individual people as possible then of course you've got well maybe we could reduce the tax credit do we need to keep it the same all of that so there is actually a study committee in place that's looking at all those issues what are they doing right now well the the so so they've been going around you know the state um you know there was a little confusion at first at least within our industry whenever they announced you know this the five or six dates and the locations of their of the committee's you know review of this as they went around they first went to savannah in in august and then they just uh went to rome i think it was last week and then next week they'll be in athens but what they decided to do is they pick topics along along the film uh, along the tax credits um, of different tax credits they pick topics so as an example martha in savannah the savannah folks really expected that the film industry would be able to, you know, present their case and show information, um, et cetera. But, but the committee did not have film on the agenda. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. th- and then they went to Rome and then there was another, um, you know, job jobs credit that was being reviewed there. So film again was not on the, on the agenda. So then next week in Athens, film is on the agenda, film and music and the, you know, the Georgia Entertainment Industry Investment Act. So there was a little bit of confusion about, about you know, hey, why, you know, why go around the state and just pick topics? Because, you, you know, you want to get a – you go around the state to sort of get a holistic view of how it's impacting in all the areas you're reviewing. But this is the way they've done it, and, and it's fine, you know. But, um, uh, 
that's where they're at with, with it. So there's really no results so, to share with you, Martha, at this time about like what they found and what they decided. But it, but it is happening, and it's in the, you, in the middle. There's two more days. Do you? Because I think a lot of us obviously focus on the stars we see or the stars we hear that are coming to Georgia. But you know, it's so many more people. Uh, that are working what is the number do we have a number of people that are working in the entertainment industry because of the tax credit coming to georgia oh wow it's it it, it depends on the um it depends on how you look at it i mean it's it's a it's i've heard 134,000 i've heard 210,000 um it's it's tens of thousands um, but you know, it depends on like, how do you classify that? Right, so it's hard right. for me to like pin that number. Uh, and one, one person that's looking at that is, is David Sutherland, who is, who's on, who's on our tour and will be speaking next week in Columbus at the university of Georgia. And he studies creative economies. And that, that is an area that we're hoping to, that, that everybody in the industry can sort of get on the same page with of one, you know, um, what is the creative industries and, and what does it include so we can all agree and identify that this is the number and this is how we're going to classify it. And, and the other is that will also help lead to uh, being able to target and isolate, you know, the actual number of payroll Georgians that are involved in it. But it is definitely a significant um, number. And, Martha, I don't know if you saw it, but the the direct spin that the state reported a couple of weeks ago, uh, you probably covered this too. The massive tourism dollars of seventy-three billion dollars spent last uh, in the physical year that the state uh, uh, reported. You know um, that was a big number. Then that same week, it was reported that four point one billion was spent uh, on direct spending on film productions last year. So this is billions of dollars being dropped right into Georgia's economy. Well, it's it's always great to talk to you. Uh, what's the next stop on the road tour? Well, we're going. We'll be in Columbus next week, and and we have a great event there. So so we, the, the Athens Review Committee is is October the fourth, and then so that's interesting in Athens and um, and and timely for Columbus to have an event the following evening uh, Thursday, and then we go to Warner Robins in middle of October. Uh, on to Rome, and then we we uh, then we are in Savannah in November, uh, mid mid November. So we we're busy, Martha. I'm going to get you out. How, how are you? Are you are you gonna, you're going to be able to come to the Atlanta event in December? You promised in our last call. Oh yes, <laughs> absolutely. Healed, healed I will. I'm I'm six weeks out from my knee replacement. I got completely released to do everything. I'm way ahead <laughs> of the curve on recovery. So um, I uh, you know it's all good. So yeah, I should be by December. I should be. <laughs> 100 percent that'll be great thanks randy perfect thank you to hear the full versions of last week's martha zoller shows go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com and you can follow me on social media at martha zoller